Okay, uh, just want to thank uh, Walter for having me. It's great. It's great to be back. Um, for helping out. So, yeah, this this talk is coming out of uh, the ten years I spent in Istanbul, and uh, I'm a beat scholar, but I didn't really expect to find the beats there. So this is sort of a, it was an interesting moment to to sort of show up, uh, and it's just kind of grew out of you know students bringing me materials. Uh, Hey, have you seen this? Check this out. Here to the beats. Here's this. I didn't realize that, that, that this, you know, topic was even available, really. Uh, but as I went on and started collecting more material and got more and more interested, uh, this is it. So I'm, I'm drawing from my forthcoming book, Translating the Counterculture: The Reception of the Beats in Turkey. And so what I would like to do is give you a kind of a couple of examples of the kind of work I'm doing and sort of what's happening with this topic. Uh, and also along the way, a bit of the methodology. So for a lot of you uh, that have been in social sciences, or if you're in social science, some of this stuff is kind of straightforward. But for my field in literature, um, it's less so. So uh, that's another, to me, selling point of the book, is that I'm trying to uh, talk about what readers are doing with text rather than um, you know, simply providing you know, structural analyses of the books or, or simply going through and, and discussing my thoughts on the text. I mean, I'm doing that, but I'm, uh, in order to sort of get a sense of what, what people are actually doing, re reception of, of, the war, of the war. Okay, so I'll read a little bit, and then I'll kind of stop, and we can kind of look at some images, and uh, you know, I'll kind of talk. I know it could be kind of numbing to sort of listen to someone read, read text the whole time, so I'll try to break it up. And I guess if you have questions, I don't mind if you jump in, but you know, you can hold them on at the end as well too, whatever works best for you. <clears throat> okay, translating the counterculture of the reception of the beats in Turkey. As recently as 2012, William S. Burroughs' novel, The Soft Machine, underwent a trial for obscenity in Turkey. The Committee for the Protection of Minors from Harmful Publications felt that the book was an affront to Turkish morals claiming it was, quote, an account of an undisciplined sex addict that holds no moral principle dear. This is a government body that makes sure books are safe for, for Turkish readers. Despite this blanket condemnation, the trial was really about the sensitive topic of homosexuality. Not only did Burroughs' highly graphic homoerotic depictions rankle the committee, but in Turkish, the word soft is also slang for passive homosexual practices. While the legal dynamics of the Turkish trial shared many similarities to the various censorship battles the Beats were embroiled in during the early post-war period in the United States, cultural and temporal differences have lent new meanings to the proceedings. Rather than backing down, the publisher and translator of the book, along with various supporters, chose not only to fight the allegations in court, but to publicize the proceedings in blogs, on websites, and through Facebook in order to raise awareness of government repression and to combat Turkish homophobia. The stakes in the trial were real. The publisher faced heavy fines and even jail time, while the book supporters risked public condemnation and harassment. The trial demonstrates that the beats and their message of dissent have been given an afterlife. If countercultural literature is meant to counter a culture, what happens when another culture borrows that critique? I want to address that question by examining the reception of the beat generation in Turkey. In their own cultural moment, the beats were <clears throat> the beats were seen as direct threats to both social and literary propriety. Today the beats are less iconoclastic than iconic, and while their works do still inspire many to question the society in which they live, they are far more likely to be seen as nostalgic reminders of a time when us versus them seemed easier to define. I wrote that year, a while ago, so now maybe that's not true. I mean, as us versus them maybe it's easier. Uh, to, to figure out in a polarized political climate of today, but uh, certainly felt that way a couple of years ago. Yet in Turkey, the beats and their message of dissent are once again socially relevant. Since the 1990s, the beats and their texts have been increasingly translated, reviewed, and discussed in mainstream, academic, online, and underground forums. Although Allen Ginsberg and Peter Orlovsky were the only beat writers to actually visit the country, publishers, editors, critics, readers, and editors dissatisfied with what they feel to be a more conservative trend in Turkey have turned to the beats and other countercultural forebears for alternatives. This unexpected return of beat nonconformity and protest into new cultural and temporal conditions offers a unique opportunity, opportunity to rethink both the cultural logics that made the beats possible in the first place 
as well as the possibilities they might still hold for contemporary social critique. Examining the beats outside the time and place of their own production calls into question the assumptions that they have accreted around beat text by exploring how meaning is contingent on local conditions and particular needs. And this is sort of the, the, the crux of the book. You know, the, uh, reception's really about how, how people are dealing with things in their particular moment, how they're using them for their own, their own purposes. In this talk, I argue that the beat concepts such as personal freedom, spatial mobility, and the importance of the individual that may seem self-evident in a Western context become re-articulated when deployed in Turkey, and these cultural and temporal differences have an effect on the ways in which beat texts are received. In addition, a discussion of the ways in which the beats and their texts are disseminated provides insight into the viability of their countercultural message today. Examining the beats outside the place and moment of their original reception is crucial, not only because it is an inescapable fact in our globalized world that the beats are no longer simply a U.S. phenomenon, but also because such an exploration helps us to better understand how we arrived at our present understanding of the beats, and how we have chosen to frame their social and literary relevance. <clears throat> beat scholarship has tended to focus on individual beat authors and their contributions to particularly American post-war issues. When transnational issues do emerge, they revolve around studies of influence, cross-hybridization, cross and the impact of international experience on the beats themselves. <laughs> There has been, unfortunately, a dearth of scholarship that directly addresses how the beats are received by larger readerships or the role translation plays in reception. Shelley Fisher Fishkin, in her often cited presidential address to the American Studies Association, includes studies of cultural translation in her call for a more transnational approach to the field. This is a quote from her speech. We need to understand the cultural work that forms origin originating in the United States do in cultures outside this country studying their reception and reconfiguration in contexts informed by a deep understanding of the countries where that cultural work is taking place. If the beats are still a potential force for social and cultural change, as I believe they are, then it behooves beat critics to examine how their texts function in various contexts. As a plethora of blogs, trade publications, Facebook pages, and online memes indicate, the beats are clearly being reproduced, both here and in Turkey. And thus it makes sense to turn a scholarly eye to the ways in which the beats are re-entering the social field, both in the U.S. and outside its borders. What is lacking in the field is a consideration of what beat means today. In order to fully understand the reception of the beats in Turkey, it is important to look not only at textual translation and its concomitant issues, but also at paratextual materials that are essential in understanding how the beats function in their displaced cultural context. The function of the obscenity trial of Burroughs' text for both the government and its critics, for example, can only be understood through an analysis of court documents, press releases, jacket blurbs, journal articles in mainstream media, and in-depth interviews with those involved in the debate. Given that the appropriation of the soft machine in its trial in Turkey is taking place over half a century after its initial publication, the trial highlights what is at stake when B-texts are translated across both temporal and cultural gaps. Those using the book to combat what they feel are faults in Turkish society have been savvy in their use of the internet, disseminating court documents and social commentary outside censored media channels in order to reach a wider and international audience to gain support for their cause. Turkish readers, editors, translators, and others interested in the beats redeploy these texts in ways that are meaningful for local concerns. So let me give you a couple of examples here. So this is the back cover to the book. Uh, Burroughs' novel, Soft Machine, uh, you know, the, the publisher, what they've done here is they basically included an excerpt from the committee, right, this, you know, committee that's claiming this book is dangerous to youth and it's, it's you know, the, the uh, result of this sex addict, blah, blah, blah. And so it's kind of an interesting moment, I think, in terms of books marketing where uh, they take they taken this so the, the book I'm interested in the book you know as as kind of a cult, countercultural critique I mean it, it is that I mean it does have homoerotic depictions it is challenging uses of language etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but the people that are, are using the book uh, are interested in that but they're also interested in highlighting the social commentary that's sort of built up around the text and that I think that's interesting uh, the way that the way that's working uh, and it's you know back covers and again press releases. Uh, online blurbs, uh, websites, just to get the message out. So, so people, even if they haven't read the book, they're still getting the sense of this countercultural message. I think it's kind of a fascinating 
uh, fascinating thing and important for the idea of the beats as countercultural, even though even for people that might not be reading reading all their texts. Here's another example as well. This is uh, the back of a journal uh, put out by Aldekirk Besh. This is uh, another underground, um, you know, beat-inspired press. Uh, Publish a bunch, they publish a bunch of translations and things like that. And, and this, the back of the journal has another advertisement. Uh, you know, more the William S. Burroughs' cut up trilogy called Mor Moralists, uh, Lacking Morals. And at the bottom, um, I'll use the point here, the B generation is standing trial in the Turkish courts. So again, in the middle, you also have this large excerpt from the committee. So it's a way of kind of it's selling the book, but it's also you know selling the message, which is basically uh, these you know this kind of thinking needs to be challenged. Uh, okay, um, <clears throat> to fully understand the beat's relevance to Turkey requires an objective appraisal of who is reading this material and why they are reading it. So on the one hand, I'm interested in you know publishers and people in the sort of the literary field, but I'm also interested in just you know readers. What are people doing? What do people make of this? Right, uh, people on the street or people that pick up the book. In order to accomplish this, a methodological approach novel to literary studies is required. Typically, literary analysis proceeds from close readings of texts coupled with a theoretical framework that helps to make sense of the work. This book goes a step further by employing the more quantitative methods of the social sciences, as well as appeals to paratextual materials such as online discussions, government documents, personal interviews, and news reports. Translating the counterculture is also informed by sociological research conducted as part of a Turkish government-funded study designed to elucidate the readership of underground literature. This novel approach is crucial for gaining a better understanding of how the beats are received. According to John Carlos Rowe in the New American Studies, quote, we should acknowledge that a great deal of work in American studies is conducted without statistical, clinical, demographic, and other forms of empirical evidence that would make this work more both that would make this work both more convincing and more conversant with disciplines in the social, natural, physical, and health sciences. Understanding reader response can only come through a mixed method of inquiry that combines both traditional literary analysis and other modes of sociological investigation to provide a clearer picture of the role the beats and their texts are playing in Turkey. So I'll give you a few more examples. Um, I'm assuming nobody's reading Turkish, which is fine. I'll explain this just generally really quick. Basically, I got funding to do a study uh, in Turkey from the Turkish government looking at readers of this underground literature phenomenon. So we looked at 300, 300 or so non-readers, uh, but who, people who read, and then 300 or so readers or self-identified readers of underground literature. Uh, and so what was kind of useful for this, for, for the book, was uh, for the non-readers, one thing we like to do uh, was give them passages from underground text. So this is a, on, on the top part, uh, the, the blue here, this is a passage from a writer, a Turkish underground writer, writing in the, in the kind of a beat vein. He's borrowing from Allen Ginsberg here and writing a poem called Turkey, which is basically kind of calling Turkey out for these things he doesn't like, right? Um, and, you know, he's raising these provocative issues. I, I want sex shops and communist parties and Islamic democratic parties and rock parties and, and gay bars and blah, 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 blah. And seeing what uh, what people did with this, right? What non-readers did with this, and so we have a series of, of of sort of questions down here. You know, is this is this text? Does this text have literary value? Um, you know, is is it useful for opening up debate? You know, things like that. And then getting a sense of the scale. You know, how to what extent people agree with this or disagree with it, and get a sense of what readers are doing with it, or how they would react to that. Uh, for readers of the genre, we also ask questions about why they're, re why they're reading this stuff, you know, what they're getting out of it, if anything. We're going to get some kind of hard, hard evidence as to what's going on, and then also allowing us here uh, to see what they're reading, right? Um, so on the left-hand side here, we have a list of texts. Some of these are in English, some are in Turkish, um, and some are novels, some are films. Uh, and then, you know, up here we're asking, you know, do, have you read it or seen it? watched it, have you heard about it, have you not heard about it, did you like it, did you not like it, uh, you know, these kinds of questions to kind of get, you know, provide a sort of an overall map of, of what people are looking at uh, and what they think about that. <clears throat> okay, so back, back to the text. So 
So in order to understand the role beat texts play in Turkey, it is crucial to trace their initial reception to the concept of the underground. Uh, and this is a term borrowed from the West, right? So the, the underground literature, uh, even though it's sometimes translated as, as, as Yer Alta, under the ground, it's still an, an import. Even the, the term for this, these, these texts are sort of an import as well. While some beat poetry was translated as early as, as early as the 1960s in Turkish literary journals, the beat's increased visibility in the culture really began much later in the early 1990s. So one thing that I was, I was interested in is the fact that, you know, beat's 1950s, 1960s phenomenon, they kept writing for a while, uh, but, you know, the fact that there's sort of a, a big gap in reception, which is kind of fascinating for, for somebody, a culture to kind of receive a bulk of these texts, you know, 40, 50 years later, uh, with the internet and all these other sort of means of um, communication available. What, what does that mean and what does that say? <clears throat> Following the easing of restrictions and access to foreign materials in the wake of the 1980 coup, rock and roll fanzines began to appear that provided readers with access to information about the beats and translations of their work. So this, this is one such, one such uh, fanzine, fanzine. And, um, Quickly, I guess, the, the coup, Turkey has gone through a number of these coups, the 1980 coup being sort of the watershed coup. I mean, this is seen as uh, a, a shift from a kind of Marxist sort of resistance, uh, left and right groups, fight, student groups fighting, I mean, literally killing each other in the streets. Uh, the coup comes, there's a, there's a huge clamp down, a lot of repression. But what's interesting is, even though there's a lot of sort of social repression, at the same time, there's an opening of the markets. So there's a, there's a huge influx of Western products coming in. So uh, basically my contention is, is that uh, the resistance change, the model for resistance kind of changes from a kind of earlier, kind of more concrete Marxist uh, materialist kind of rebellion to a kind of cultural rebellion, right? A rebellion being fought in, in, you know, in, in these kinds of literary spaces and in, in, in media. That's why that's really important. Okay, so, um, it's really after this coup that the beat, beat work start, start arriving. Uh, but because the beats were interspersed among other countercultural texts, editors needed a catch-all term to describe this new form of cultural import and settled on the underground. This reception history is important for understanding the subsequent appropriation of the beats in Turkey. The term underground, borrowed directly from Western countercultural tradition, describes a range of countercultural products from bands like Led Zeppelin and Nirvana, to critical theorists like Guy Debord, to film mavericks like David Lynch, as well as to the Beats and other post-war post countercultural figures in both Europe and the US and North America. In addition, while earlier underground products were exclusively Western imports, over time a homegrown Turkish variant has flourished, drawing on Western models while amending and updating them for a contemporary Turkish audience. This recourse to the term underground signals a challenge to social, cultural, and artistic norms and frames the beats as either a group of texts with quote unquote you know, dark themes, characters, and storylines that transgress established norms, or as in the Soviet Samizdat tradition, as a legally distributed clandestine material. And this is sort of when you look at the, the, the debate circling that, right, you know, around around this this concept, the, the underground, the underground text. This is really what you typically see. I mean, it's either underground because it's it's you know it's challenging social expectations uh, thematically, um, or and or it's underground in the sense that it's illegally distributed. In Turkey, every publication is supposed to be stamped by the Ministry of Culture uh, and approved. Obviously, they can't read every book, uh, but that's supposed to happen. But the, these sorts of early fanzines didn't have that. They were just sort of photocopied, stapled, and sold from the back of bookshops and things like that. So this is kind of the, the context for it. And this one, I think, is a, this is the first you know, Turkish fanzines, according to other critics. And you see that it's heavily, heavily borrows from Western tradition. Mondo, Mondo Trasho is, is a complete um, sort of nod to, to this sort of 60s kind of uh, <clears throat> extravagant kind of um, <coughs> countercultural tradition. A lot of it's in English, not all of it, but a lot of it's in English. Right, uh, and you see Jack Kerouac on the bottom here. So the beats are, are you know, even at this point, are are, are sort of still being rep are being represented here, uh, but it's kind of eclectic. I mean, you know, there's Divine, right? This is this image is from David Lynch's Eraserhead, Genet. Uh, so there's a whole kind of range of countercultural options, and this is sort of a typical kind of um, 
strategy for these or these early early pieces where you kind of just put a bunch of stuff together, right? It's all underground. It's all countercultural, so uh, it all fits together. Even though for us it seems a bit odd. Uh, here's another one. Uh, Chalunta. This is a, a rock and roll fanzine, uh, but again, they're you know they'll have issues come out. This is like their beat issue. And this this image is actually taken from a beat exploitation film from the 50s, but just basically repurposed to kind of provide a kind of a shocking sexual undertone kind of uh, cover that. Uh, you know, that they used to exploit it. And, you know, the articles oftentimes uh, informative articles about the beats, uh, and usually a series of translations, right, into Turkish that, you know, would allow readers to kind of get a sense of what, what this group's doing. Here's a more contemporary one. The, 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 the series says 2040, obviously that's not yet happened. So this is kind of like a, Again, a kind of a in-your-face punk style, uh, and the you know you can read most of this to yourself. Uh, situationalism, uh, Che, you know Burroughs is there um, on the left, so you have him. Uh, so it's B, Henry Miller, Chicago '68. So it's it's very much drawing on a kind of a '50s '60s counterculture, but also up updating it Turkish punk poetry. Um, Cyberpunk. I mean, it's kind of a little bit of everything, right? This is probably uh, 2008. Right? So this is a, late, a later instantiation of this, but you, you get the idea. And then, and then finally, the, these early ones are very much sort of Western oriented. But uh, as I mentioned here, uh, what happened was is Turkish writers started started picking up the genre, right? So then you have a whole kind of Turkish underground writing as well. And so this one is, is by a really well-known, probably the most well-known underground writer, uh, Hakan Gunday. Um, this is his novel, Pitch or Bastard. Uh, and you can, it's hard to make out, but here his, his, uh, his, his shirt or his body is a, is a Turkish lira banknote. Uh, and you have this kind of post-apocalyptic kind of background. This is, it looks like potentially like a, a moss in the background. And it's just like this kind of captures the kind of, you know, um, in general, the kind of feelings about underground literature, right? So this dark, pessimistic, kind of brooding uh, uh, literature. Uh, and in, in the Turkish sense, a lot of it was, because the, you know, the Turkish writers who were rebelling against society, putting these books out, were very much anti-establishment and, and uh, fairly bleak. Most of the characters in these novels were fairly bleak. Uh, and that kind of set a tone for a kind of the beat reception. Today, you know, beats have kind of gotten more attention, and they kind of people see this. They're not just underground; they're also this, these literary figures. So this is kind of changing. But certainly at the beginning, in the '90s, into the 2000s, even in, even into today, still the, the you know the, the sort of that framework is still kind of hinges on people's reception of the beats, right? They're kind of this dark, uh, anti-conformist literature. That's that's the idea. Okay. So I'd like to talk briefly now about um, On the Road. So I've kind of given you some, some general images and idea of what's going on. I want to kind of, kind of uh, bring that into a specific case here with Jack Kerouac's novel On the Road, which uh, I'm looking at his translation, looking at interviews and, and discussions of, of what's going on around him, but also how uh, cultural context makes a difference here. That's my argument. Tracking the beats outside the initial moment of the reception reveals the necessarily interested nature of cultural translation. Consider, for example, how that post-war countercultural classic of exuberance, Jack Kerouac's influential On the Road, has been received in Turkey. On the Road is well known and well respected, but often encounters resistance or bewilderment as cultural differences render some of its countercultural messages difficult to implement in the Turkish context. Ultimately, however, such difficulties are productive as they provide an opportunity to understand how the logics of a particular cultural moment become translated into other contexts. Taking On the Road to Turkey allows us to better see the assumptions that both the novel and its readers are making. For many living in the containment culture of the 1950s, reading Kerouac's novel was a transformational <coughs> event. On the Road opened up a new way to live, a new way to write, and even a new way to think. Despite its revolutionary nature, the novel nevertheless draws on particularly American themes that are not always so easily transferable to other cultural moments. Take, for example, Kerouac's stress on individuality. 
that the character of Dean Moriarty, on the road replaces post-war social expectations involving work, marriage, and family with the freedom to pursue personal desire in every moment. But an examination of the novel's reception in Turkey provides an opportunity to re-examine the nature and function of this freedom. Dean's extreme, Dean's extreme individualism meets resistance in a more collectivist culture such as Turkey. Bereft of family, Dean has no, t no ties to those around him. He does have wives and children, though he easily leaves them behind at a moment's notice. Dean, Dean does search for his father and is excited to reconnect with his cousin, but he never finds his father, and his cousin, during the course of their brief conversation, disowns him. Dean's communal ties are equally tenuous. His childhood neighborhood consists of the bars and cheap hotels of his father's drunken milieu, and though he does have a circle of friends in Denver, Dean is happier being on the road. Dean's tendency to retain his freedom at all costs comes across as bizarre in a country where familial and communal ties are very much enforced. I don't know if you've read the novel, but Dean, Dean stands for individual freedom and desire in every moment. Right? He just does whatever he wants, basically. Uh, and my argument here is that's fine, but that's coming up against a kind of uh, a Turkish kind of cultural conception, which is very much at odds with that. Dean's rebelliousness resides not just in his individuality, but also in the fact that he is in constant motion. Such mobility is destabilizing since it challenges the assumption of containment culture that citizens should be loyal and dependable, while men in their gray flannel suits hold a steady job at a company so they can make mortgage payments to support their wives and children. Dean insists on living a life free of encumbrances that might limit his movement. The idea of personal mobility, as the title suggests, draws on a history of U.S. territorial expansion and is one of the lasting legacies of On the Road. Yet here again, the notion of the freedom of movement is problematic in Turkey, <clears throat> as the numerous extra-textual discussions of the term hobo in the Turkish reception makes clear. There really is no Turkish equivalent for those willfully dropping out of society to wander the country that are so celebrated in Kerouac's novel. The critic Zeynep Demersu argues, quote, maybe a term used constantly on the road and left without translation in the Turkish version since it implies something more than idleness or vagrancy might illuminate us, hobo. After expressing some reservations with Kerouac's novel in terms of its treatment of women, Demersu goes on to discuss what she sees as an important figure of the hobo by providing a brief history of the concept in the United States. Another critic, another Turkish critic, Erol Bakan, claims the term resembles the older Ottoman word serguzesh, or adventure, <clears throat> and on the road's Turkish translator, Jean Kantarja, does not even translate the term, preferring to add a footnote explaining that, quote, in America this name is given to people who travel by illegally boarding trains. They have no permanent place to stay, no money, and look like beggars. They find work here and there. But there are people who consciously prefer this lifestyle. In Turkey, the road is the means to get from village to city and back again. While events certainly occur on it, it is the destination that matters more than the travel. And this is, I don't have the time, but uh, part of the book t picks up, you don't see too many of these Turkish road novels. They're there, but they're, they're, they're not, you know, there's not that many. What you do see is in Turkish film. There's quite a lot of Turkish films that deal with, uh, you know, <clears throat> characters traveling from one place to another, usually from the city to the, to the village, or the village to the city. You know, they're migrating the city to escape the village and get work, etc., or they're, they're going back to their roots in the village. And if you look at those, those films, um, you know, they're, the characters are on the road, but it's really not about being on the road. It's really about the road is a temporary escape from the decisions that have to be made either in the city or in the village, right? And that, that's, the, that's the focus. So uh, this kind of destinationless travel experience is, is very different and has to be kind of explained in the Turkish context. <coughs> me. Finally, On the Road is an optimistic book. While the carefree and pleasure-driven lifestyle of Dean epitomizes becomes more and more problematic upon subsequent rereadings, usually later in life, Kerouac's novel was nevertheless written in a particularly affluent period of U.S. history and is infected with the optimism of the times. Given Turkey's volatility, and indeed the increased economic uncertainties worldwide, the novel's Turkish reception complicates On the Road's anti-consumerist stance by highlighting, by highlighting the economic optimism that underpins the novel. As one of my Turkish students, Gizem Uzkan, explained during an online discussion of the novel, this is a long quote from my student, Turkish student, 
However, when we consider today's Turkey because of overpopulation and poverty, a regular university graduate might not find the job Sal finds temporarily in the book. We are burdened with debt mostly and should constantly think about the future in every step we take, not necessarily to achieve a good quality of life, but to prevent becoming poor. What I am trying to say is because of a non-functioning social state, our future is never guaranteed and this might lead us to obtain a more precarious point of view as a society. Gizem was not the only student to point out the problems that have plagued Turkey over the years. Inflation, currency devaluation, and unemployment have created a culture filled with anxiety over the economic situation, a country where one thinks less about a good quality of life and more about simply not, quote, becoming poor. Today's Turkey is experiencing one of its strongest periods of growth ever, but the 2016 coup attempt has already created fears that the economic situation could change overnight. Economic instability exists in the U.S., of course, and Gazem is, is voicing concerns relevant to any graduating university student. I mean, some of this was, I, I sort of conducted an online discussion with, with American students reading the novel as well, so there was some dialogue. And I mean, American students too, you know, uh, were also kind of anxious about that, you know. It'd be, it'd be weird to live like Dean because he just kind of assumes things are going to work out. But, you know, I mean, who can assume that these days, right? But uh, in Turkey, the situation is sort of, is sort of compounded. And, uh, the Turkish students I had anyway, and the people I talked to, you know, felt this, this lifestyle seemed very strange. Uh, whereas in America, when I teach on the road, there's usually one student a semester will, oh, wow, let's try it, you know, let's go, let's go get in the car and go on this trip. Um, that didn't seem to happen in the Turkish context. It seemed like a very odd, odd novel. <clears throat> so, but on the roads, Turkish reception reveals that Kerouac's novel is firmly rooted in an American optimism that is, no, is by no means universal and timeless. Dislodging Kerouac from his American moorings and placing him in a Turkish context, did it, placing him in a Turkish context demonstrates just how important cultural context is when trying to understand meaning. It is precisely in these disjuncts where cultural translation comes to the fore that allow everyone, Turkish and Western readers alike, to think about the assumptions behind our reading. The meaning of these difficulties in reception are polyvalent. For some readers, the difficulty of implementing the sort of lifestyle changes chronicled in Kerouac's novel means that On the Road becomes read as a spiritual rather than a literal quest. For others in the underground scene, it is precisely these moments of cultural dissonance that offer a chance for Turkey to become more individualistic, more mobile, perhaps even more optimistic. And this, is, this came up in interviews, people that, a lot of times people publishing this stuff, you know, that, that's what they wanted. You know, Turkey's too, there's too much communal thinking. We need a, a text that are, you know, going to sort of shake that up. And so that's part of the reason for getting the material out there. <clears throat> One of the most interesting aspects of On the Road is, is its provocative nature. Readers seem forced to take a stand on the book. For many women and ethnic minority readers, Kerouac's novel is extremely problematic in its character depictions. In Turkey, many women readers have voiced similar concerns allowing us to talk not only about cultural differences, but similarities in interpretation across cultures. So in some ways, I'm, I'm arguing Turkey's very different, but in other ways, it, it's actually kind of contemporaneous with America, you know, given that the readership is quite young and people are online and, and you know, it's a sort of global youth culture. One could argue to a certain, to a certain extent it's sort of a global youth culture. And that, that in, in some ways, that's on par. I mean, it's sort of instantaneous kind of uh, um, sort of not equality, but a similar reception in some ways, which is, I find interesting. Uh, finally, such a displacement is by no means unidirectional. Kerouac himself maps his anxieties and concerns onto a mythic East throughout the novel as he registers unease about Dean's lifestyle. Thus, reading On the Road in the Space Between Cultures makes the assumptions that have accreted around the novel and the cultural work those assumptions perform more visible. Am I doing okay on time? Am I doing okay on time? Yeah, you're not worth in this. Okay, let me just... <clears throat> need a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, I'll definitely. Okay, uh, I won't read this part, but I'll look at it uh, just quickly before I kind of uh, wrap up. Uh, talk about Allen Ginsberg's um, poem, How. So another chapter of the book basically looks at these various translations of the poem, How. And uh, you know, these have occurred over... You know, Ginsberg got translated fairly early, so these translations have occurred over a, a wider time span. Uh, and it's sort of interesting to, to see how they break down. Um, so we have an earlier 1976 translation, uh, before the 1980 coup, 
uh, we have a 1991 translation, um, and then we have a 2013 translation. So I look at a lot of the, a lot of the text, but uh, just to kind of give you a sample, he, here's a line. The, the first the first one here up here. This is this is stuff from Ginsberg's actual poem, uh, "The Madman Bum an Angel Beat in Time Unknown." And if you look at the translation, it can be kind of interestingly revealing. So this is the 1976 version, Daru and Edgu, uh, and they translated "Madman." Um, and, and times angelically beaten ones be unknown. This beat, I, I apologize, this should be italicized, in, uh, I'm sorry, this should be bolded. In the text, in their text, it's actually bolded. So <clears throat> what's, what's interesting here is that, um, you know, 1976, people had, didn't really have any idea of the beats, right? Uh, and then again, they were working in a, in a very kind of earlier ether model, they were trying to introduce, trying to introduce the beats as a new model or as, a, as a, another model of resistance to, a, to a, a left that at the time is very much caught up in the kind of Marxist rebellion. Um, and so beat here has to be kind of put in a list form and kind of explained, right? You know, what, it's not quite clear what it is. Our slan, right here, the second one, Mad Men Bum and Angel Beat in Time, provides a fairly direct translation. In fact, when you talk to the people involved in this scene, uh, everyone points to our slan as sort of the quote unquote best translation, right? Uh, this is partly because in 19, by 1991, um, you know, people had kind of seen this stuff. It was around, uh, and Arslan could kind of count on a little bit more of a familiarity with the beats, uh, and, and could kind of not bother with some, somehow explaining them. He could sort of just translate them. And this final one, Shinol uh, Erdogan, not the current Erdogan in charge, but you know, this, another man with the last name, uh, renders it mad bum in time and sanctified angel unknown. And, and what, what's interesting about Chanel Erdogan's 2013 uh, translation is that he kind of makes it, he sort of plays up the mystical spiritual Ginsburg, right? So Ginsburg as, as the kind of Buddhist guru, kind of uh, mystical guy, uh, becomes the focus here. Um, and you see it, you see this in the cover material. So this is the 1976 translation. And this is actually Ginsburg and another beat writer, uh, Lawrence Berlinghetti. Uh, and, and you see that their faces almost like meld in the middle here, and it's kind of like a blob. Um, and the title of the poem, you know, they don't really house Ginsburg's most famous poem, but uh, the, 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 the title here is America, right? It's about sort of a comment on America, a comment on the West, on capitalism. And Ferlinghetti is a nice choice because in keeping with the sort of the Marxist tenor of the times, Ferlinghetti is also a very kind of socially conscious leftist poet. Uh, so, you know, the choice is telling here, you know, sort of pre, pre-1980 coup, uh, you know, a highly kind of materialist kind of rebellion, and so you choose two poets that are very much in line with that. Whereas by 1991, with Arslan, <clears throat> you can see how he's kind of picked up on this fanzine style. He's got these kind of pasted bits. It's sort of this kind of catchy, kind of visually stunning piece. He's titled his, his collection, or his selected poems, uh, Kushbein, which is basically bird brain. Uh, Allen Ginsberg has a poem, Bird Brain, and it's a political poem, but it's also kind of a, a self takedown uh, of, of Ginsberg. It's, it's, it's sort of personal as well as political. So the, the choice is kind of telling. I mean, Arslan's going for a kind of a, a, a personal Ginsberg uh, here, and he kind of gets it by, by this choice. And then this is, this is the original publication of Ginsberg's How in this style. And what's interesting here, Chanel uh, Erdogan is uh, Alta Kukbesh Publishing House, basically borrowed the format. So by 2013, you know, Chanel uh, Erdogan can kind of count on enough familiarity with the beats that he can, he can kind of borrow the formatting of the original book. Uh, and not everyone's going to get it, but more people are going to get it. Um, and it it's, uh, ends up playing on, uh, again, this, this spiritual, mystical Ginsburg. This is the this is Erdogan's uh, the back cover to Erdogan's translation and the special uh, limited edition copy of the translation. As you see here, he's taken this word holy, which is he borrows from a section of how where Ginsburg declares everything holy. You know, holy this, holy that. I'm, I'm declaring everything holy. <coughs> this reclaiming '50s contained America um, culture as kind of mystical and, and, and you know sort of spiritual. Um, Erdogan's translation borrows that and kind of makes this sort of quasi-infinite sort of, you know, uh, spiral 
right? And then this is picked up in various ways as well. They have a, they have a, a filmed reading of this, uh, of this work. And in the filming, they start with uh, Jaladin uh, Medvani Rumi's uh, spiritual poetry. So the Sufi master is, is you know, um, poems from the Sufi master are being recited against the background of the reed flute, which the reed flute is a, a, a borrowing from the um, Sufi tradition, the lodges and things. So the whole, the whole kind of thrust is very much spiritual mystical, uh, which I argue, I mean, you can look at it in various ways. And one way is, is a way of, I think, providing a counter narrative to um, you know, uh, Rajat Tayyip Erdogan's kind of increasing Islamization of the country. So it's, it's religious, but you know, going back to an earlier model of Turkish religion, right, with, with Mevlana Rumi, uh, I think this is what they're, part of what they're going for in the translation. Okay, so let me just wrap up with a couple paragraphs and we can open it up for questions. The 2016 coup attempt in Turkey calls into question the parameters within which the beats can function. Does the sort of, does the sort of countercultural rebellion the beats offer make sense in an increasingly autocratic state as, such as today's Turkey? Beat works are still available, but whether they will remain a viable means for social resistance remains to be seen, especially given Turkey's willingness to stifle and suppress free speech and the press. In such a climate, rebellion in Turkey may once again turn violent or be crushed altogether. The current situation in Turkey thus presents a test case for whether the beats need an open democratic society in order to function as generators of social change. The beats were used by students and dissenters to challenge autocratic rule in the post-war Soviet bloc. Can they be useful in challenging today's repressive and despotic regimes? Placing the beats in a global context also provides a novel means of thinking about the importance of language in the reception of beat texts. The beats are championed as literary innovators who drew on both high, high and low culture to craft a new style of writing inspired by the breath rhythms of jazz and the spoken word. But texts change when translated, and it behooves us to pay closer attention to what happens when beat works are brought over into another language. Unfortunately, translations have thus far received scant attention in beat scholarship. But it might be time to discuss what is at stake when a beat style that is now accepted as formally innovative becomes reformed in another language. William S. Burroughs, for instance, believed that by challenging the reader's linguistic expectations, his cut-up method literally, literally, literally revealed a deeper truth concealed in his text. But stylistic innovation is not always so easily carried over into translation. This is not to say that the beats are untranslatable, or that Burroughs' claim should be always be taken at face value. Translation studies, however, has demonstrated that every translator makes choices that impact the text and its possible interpretations. The beats in Turkish are not exactly the beats in English, and that gap highlights the sort of assumptions we tend to make about the beats and their use of language. It also calls into question, I think, you know, English is a global lingua franca today, right? I mean, in other words, uh, the beats have benefited by readers being able to read the originals, and they've also benefited uh, by um, the dis dispersion of English has allowed more people to be able to translate works from English, right? Uh, and that, that's been, um, it's not a bad thing, but it's something that kind of made me think about. Finally, when the Beats first burst onto the po post-war scene, they were branded as rebellious outsiders who purposely transgressed social and literary standards. As the Beats' original moment of reception is passed, that image has lingered. Those of us in the Academy have fought hard for acceptance, acknowledging but often downplaying Beat iconoclasm in order to recuperate the beats in their texts as legitimate objects of literary study. This battle seems to have been won, as beat titles are now reissued as modern classics, quote unquote modern classics, and have found their way onto college syllabi into scholarly monographs and articles. Yet it is, yet it is, yet it is, yet it is undeniable that many readers, as well as many critics, consider these texts as blueprints for action. The reason that beats have remained so visible is that they offer readers a chance to rethink their relationship to the world around them, providing new models for living, thinking, and being, and descending. In order to understand the beats in all their complex complexity, we need to critically examine not only how beat texts function as literary objects, but also how they enter into the social field to do cultural work. The lasting power of the beat critique resides in its male malleability. Despite carrying the outward marks of the post-war era, Deep down, beat works are able to strike universal chords perfectly adaptable to diverse needs, ensuring that the beats, their texts, 
and their message will continue to circulate as long as there are people dissatisfied with the prevailing state of affairs. Thank you very much for listening. Questions, comments? Um, are there similar like, cultures in like other areas of Middle Eastern countries, even though Turkey's not really <clears throat> Middle Eastern? Yeah, no, I've, I've, I kind of looked for that. I didn't really find that, although there's obviously people reading them, and you know, you'll find you know, uh, poc pockets of this, you know, and texts are translated. Um, but I didn't find, you know, this is what, why, it's kind of serendipitous, because I just, you know, I went to Turkey for, for a job. I didn't really think that there would be this project. I figured I would just be doing research on the beats here and then coming back and writing about them. Uh, so it just happened to, to, to be the case, and I think part of it is just sort of this loosening up, uh, this, this sort of moment, uh, where you know, sort of rebellion changed over, and they were brought in, and people kind of picked up on that. Um, I haven't seen a ton of that, you know. I mean, if, if someone knows that, I would love to hear I've about it. Comment. Uh -huh. I do have a comment. I do have a comment. I was in Morocco, you know, and I was, I was familiar with the history of the beats in, in Morocco, just um, because of my parents' lifestyle. But uh, yeah. there, there was a great deal of time that Paul Bowles and other other, um, especially Paul Bowles, other beats spent time in northern Morocco, mainly Tangier and uh, close by, which is just um, um, over the water past southern Spain. But there was a book published recently, actually when I came, I was in Morocco in 2010, called Morocco Bound. And if you if you get a copy of Morocco Bound, you can probably find it at the library here or get it on Melcat. You can read about the history of the beats in Morocco. So. Yeah. Um, Definitely. Yeah, that's true. I mean, what's interesting, or what I'm trying to do here is, is think about, you know, people using these texts, and, and that, you know, th if that's happening, I, mean, I wonder, you know, I mean, are, are you know, sort of a lot of Moroccans, I mean, I know some of my colleagues in the field are Moroccan, and they're, they're interested, uh, but trying to get a sense of whether there's like a, you know, an up, upwelling, you know, of, of people interested in it. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I'd be interested to sort of know about that. In Turkey, there's, there is, there seems to be, you know, but where else, I'm, I'm not quite sure. You know, I was thinking about the, um, the moment of the counterculture moving through that part of the world in the 60s and 70s, and mm -hmm. there's a film which you probably know about um, a young couple, kind of hippie couple, getting caught <coughs> with drugs and then being brought into this impressive uh, police you know, system in, in Turkey, and that would have been about the early 70s. Do you, yeah. do you know the title of that film? Anybody have that? Um, anyway, no, so I, this, it was a, you know, really a nightmare film mm -hmm. uh, of, you know, sort of Eurocentric fantasies of, you know, going too far into the, you know, into the Orient and, you know, paying the price for mm -hmm. this forbidden knowledge, which is connected to, uh, you know, drug traffic. But I would think that there would be a comparable uh, kind of negative response to that, that moment of, you know, that cultural exchange on the part of people living in that, in, in Turkey, for instance, Westerners coming through, you know, looking for drugs, you know, getting busted. Yeah. And I wonder about the lag between that moment of the counterculture and then what it took for, um, you know, readers and younger people in Turkey to actually identify with the Rather than to see those folks as privileged, you know, Americans and Europeans mm -hmm. on their way to Afghanistan or Bali or wherever, and stopping over in Turkey and looking for, you know, basically looking for experiences and drugs. Yeah, yeah. Well, the '90s makes sense, right? I mean, so it's the internet culture, the sort of youth culture. I mean, it's more money, and you know, at that point, there's also more money in Turkey. The economy is sort of picking up by then. So you know, there, maybe there's a less of sense of us versus them, and more like, hey, here's these. Here's an option. There's these people that are doing this thing that I'm I'm kind of interested in, or I could I, you know, I could be interested yeah. in. I could pick up on that and not feel like yeah, it's like it's a direct. Such well, a direct I, I just wonder how you might find historical record of that sort of negative reaction to yeah. Western counterculture but, in the '60s and '70s, in the period in yeah. which it was, in fact, on the road in the Middle East, all the way through to Afghanistan, and you know. There's there's one one piece. There's a colleague of mine who's working on that. There's a, there's a sort of famous pudding shop in Istanbul, something on that area. And this is where like the you know the, the Western hippies would kind of show up and yeah. congregate or whatever. 
Uh, he, he's, I don't think it's out, but he has, he's worked on a book project on that from the Turkish side. Yeah. There, there's a, one document I found which is kind of like a tongue-in-cheek mocking satirization of, of that. It wasn't quite so negative. It was negative, but it wasn't, it was more of a joke, right? You know, these people, how do you know these people? Well, they, don't, they haven't taken a shower. And it's kind of stereotypical kind of hippie beatnik jokes. Um, but from a Turk, you know, in Turkish, from this Turkish newspaper saying, you know, you see, if you see these guys that have like long hair that have taken a shower wearing some ratty sweater, you know, this is some, some people hanging out maybe on their way to India, you know, this kind of thing. So there, there was a little bit of that acknowledgement of that. Um, but, but it seemed like, it was seemed fairly contained. And then the, the weird thing too I noticed is that there really, really wasn't many, there weren't many beats going to Turkey, right? That's, that's what I found. I mean, the Morocco case is very different, right? There was a lot of that. But in Turkey, everybody was talking about Turkey. I mean, the, the Turkey Istanbul comes up all the time in these beat accounts. And like I was saying with On the Road, it's almost like a, a, a you know Orientalist placeholder for anxiety. You know, it's, it's sort of murky. You know, it's, it's it's tantalizing, but it's also we're not sure about it. But in the end, really, uh, Peter Olofsky went uh, for a little bit. Ginsburg didn't go until 1990. You know, so there, the the, the, the irony is like nobody was really there. I mean, none of these guys were really there um, during that time period, which was odd, right? You'd think, you'd think that this would be something to be into, but it, it wasn't, you know, for, for whatever reason. And the people that were going were, you know, beat Knicks, but they weren't beats, you know, in the sense of beat writers for some reason. Could you, um, you mentioned that, if I heard you correctly, you wrote a book that is related to the Cold War. What was its title? Uh, ambiguous Borderlands, maybe? It's Shadow Imagery in Cold War American Culture. Is ambiguous that... Borderlands? Yeah. And that is your book? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, me, um, have you watched Mad Men on Netflix? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Whenever you said, like, anti-establishment, anti-government, um, and how he chooses, uh, I don't know, but one of the books that you were talking about, I apologize, no, about right. how he picks his own freedom versus his family life, like he has everything. He has the wife, the kids, the job, but he still wants his freedom to do what he wants to do. Yeah. It felt like they could make a Turkish version of that, it would be the exact same thing. <laughs> right. Of Mad Men, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, Mad Men's kind of coming from the opposite side of the fence, right? I mean, Dean, Dean's a character that never really gets into the system, right? He's like, he goes to reform school as a, as a kid, and then he's just constantly odd jobs, and you know he's not going to sort of succumb. Where the character of Madman is opposite; he's made it, right? But he's but he's still know. hiding within the identity of he's not himself. Yeah, he's pretending to be somebody else. The, like the whole story. Mm -hmm, right. Then when he gets found out that he could be that somebody else, he kind of still morphs into instead of saying, "Oh yeah, that's not me," I apologize for taking his fake identity. He's like, "No, that's me. I have everything the same guy has." Like. His wife dies, he pretends that he was married to the, the guy's wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, my other comment was, it seems that Western culture from the past, like 1920s type of history, always influences some other country, like India mm -hmm. or something like that. How does that even happen? Because it's so far away. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a good question. I mean, Disseminate. I mean, these these ideas float around, right? You know, it's like food. I mean, it, things travel, people bring it, books circulate, uh, and that's. I mean, to me, that's what's interesting is like how um, not just that it travels, but how how it how it touches down and what happens. Because you know, what I try to show in the book is that it's circulating, but at the same time, it's you know, the people the people that are borrowing it don't just take the whole thing. Right? I think it's not even to think. Oh well, you know, the beats. Yeah, we'll just do the beats. Well. Yeah, but no, because they're also so it's they're selecting, right? You know, it's like it's it's a process of selection. We'll take this and this and this, or we'll, you know, and, and even that's a negotiation, right? You know, some people take this, some people take that, and it's still gonna get pushback. I'm mean, not not everybody. I'm not saying that, you know, don't get me wrong. It's not like everybody in Turkey is reading the beats. I mean, this is still like a minority group of people that are dissatisfied with the way things are. You know, the bulk of people are, you know, not reading the beats, right? This is. Uh, just another way of thinking rebellion. It's just people are providing models, I think, right? Um, people are dissatisfied, they want something, maybe they don't see it in their culture. Okay, who's doing something like that that we could maybe take from, take it, reappropriate it, and then, you know, repurpose it for our own, our, our own use? I think that, that's really what's happening. 
but how that happens is kind of interesting. I agree. I mean, you know, what, why why it happens when who gets borrowed, who doesn't get borrowed. Uh, I mean, some of it makes sense, and you know, some of it doesn't. And some of it's just luck, and some of it is, is calculated on the part of, of, of you know publishers and critics and people that are, you know are kind of pushing. I mean, the people involved in this that are pushing this stuff in the Turkish end are basically leftists. You know, typically leftists from from earlier in their careers, and they sort of switched because they got thrown in jail for 10 years, and they don't want to, they're not going to go out and have a protest and get thrown in jail again, but they're going to publish a book that is subversive. That's kind of what they're doing. And, you know, that gets picked up, or doesn't. So, in the last comment was um, that most of the writers of the, the anti-government thing that's reaching into a um, Turkish, uh, Turkish culture is like they're all Caucasian white people. Like you would think that they'll be like, you know, they don't know. Like you said, they're privileged. They don't know what they're yeah. talking about. Freedom, like what is that? You should work hard. So. Well, yeah, that that's something you know. And I was kind of hoping that I mean, there are African American beat writers, okay. and so I, but I was hoping you know I was kind of I mean, you're as a scholar, you're kind of like hoping to see something, but you know, you got to be honest. It's like I was hoping that you know maybe people, other ethnic groups in Turkey might pick up on on that, you know. Uh, but they don't. That's and that's an unfortunate thing. You know, I mean, it is, it is very you know white male, and in women readers too. I mean, there's a lot of women readers. The research we did. I mean, there's quite a few women readers of this stuff because I think they're also dissatisfied looking for alternatives. Um, but not much of the the female beat writers got picked up on either. So it's still very much a white male prerogative group coming over. But that seems to, unfortunately seems to align maybe with you know Turkish chauvinism sexism issues, right? So that, that's okay, you know, in other words, that's okay. We can borrow them because we're not really worried, you know, these people might not be worried about the sexism in the beats, right? And that, you know, that's obviously gonna long-term a, pro a problem, right? I mean, you can't, you know, it's not really gonna work for everybody. It might work in a short term, because if you're, if you're a, a woman reader going, I want some, I, I want to rebel, I want some kind of model, and you have that, okay, I'll take that, but obviously it's not the, might not be the best model for you. You know, and as other thing comes becomes available, it's like, oh, wait a minute, there's another people doing even more useful work for me. You know? So the beats are in competition as well. Like, you know, there's a competition in the counterculture for who, who's who's most useful, right? But it's a question of picking, you know, picking something, picking a group at the right, you know, for a certain place, certain time, or a certain group for a certain use. Uh, and, and you know, that seems to be what's going on here at this particular juncture. You know, you're getting these, these white male beats. And, and, and it, there's been blow, there's been pushback. I mean, you know, women's groups have pushed back on, on some of this stuff, rightfully so. So I mean, there, there's there's a debate, uh, but um, Turkish feminism, it, feminist issues, uh, gay rights and stuff are still kind of getting go, getting going. I mean, they're there, but they're still getting going. So uh, we'll see what happens. Great. I I found this on the UK independent. Uh, site, uh, Midnight Express, the cult film that had disastrous consequences for the Turkish tourism industry. Yeah. So 1978 film about oh, a, nice. a yeah. Westerner who's busted and created a completely negative reception. And it is now actually, there's a there's a remake called Midnight Return um, mm -hmm. that uh, screened at the Cannes Film Festival last year, which is examining <coughs> precisely how this idea of Turkey got uh, installed, you know, through this particular moment. So it's like 78, yeah, yeah. I think would really account for the, the lack of, you know, contact, you know, with the counterculture in the 80s period. And when and you're talking about it reviving or picking up in the 90s, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I bet, I didn't, it's not a, it's a guy, so that's why I didn't, I didn't think of that movie. I've seen that and read the book. Sure. Yeah, no, that was huge. That was a huge seller. Yeah. And in Turkey, that's, that's a hated movie. I mean, that's exactly. seen that's as, you know, yeah. right. Uh, and, you know, the Turkish government, I think, um, following up on that, I think, you know, he went back to them. They had a, you know, reconciliation, and you know, so I think that's part of what happened probably. He, he got brought back, and hey, look, this was a certain time, and you know, a certain part of my life, and you know, all is forgiven. Made a remake. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, thank you. Thank you.